right, here we go back to it now. Glad you're here. Glad that um, we're able to have this conversation. And joining me now is Mark Mix, National Right to Work uh, President. Mark, good to have you back on the program. Thank you for being here, as always. Well, Steve, good to talk with you, and uh, thanks for keeping your keeping your eye on this particular issue. This is an important one. Well, the, the, look, um, worker freedom, uh, that's the issue today. And uh, pro-forced unionism has been a uh, it's been a tenet of, of Kamala Harris's comments in public. Of course, you know, now she supports building a border wall. She's against EVs. Uh, she wants no tax on tips. Pretty soon she's going to be wearing a red hat that says, Make America Great Again, and she'll be screaming, Drill, baby, drill. So maybe she doesn't believe in this anymore, Mark. There's that possibility. Well, that is possible. And, and the more data we get from the views of the American people as it relates to the idea of forcing someone to pay dues or fees to a private organization in order to work, it may be that she might be inclined to look at that for a minute or two until what? About November, whatever it is, 6th or something like that. Fifth. But it is it is really interesting. Well, I would say the day after the election. Um, oh, yeah. She wins. That's my That was my point, Steve. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, but no, she, she her position is obviously changing on lots of things. But I think based on the actions of the Biden Harris administration and probably the Harris administration if they if they can make it to that point um, it will stay very consistent on the idea of forcing workers to pay dues or fees and violating individual workers rights because that's really where the money comes from uh, the big money in politics is is you know we talk about Zuckerberg and Soros and all of those people and you know and it's interesting Mark. Hundreds- what, yeah. what occurs to me when I hear you say that is you know they're always out there they being the left, the socialists, the progressives, talking about workers' rights, and they're 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 yelling about workers' rights while stripping workers of their rights. Now, that's exactly what they're doing by forcing people into a union. You're stripping a worker of their right to choose how they want to function in their job environment, right? So they scream about workers' rights while stripping the rights from those very workers. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's what it's about, and that's what's happened for the last 90 years here in the United States when uh, the Roosevelt administration decided that they wanted to federalize labor relations. And the primary objective of that was this concept called labor peace, which means we have to have labor peace. And the only way we can achieve that is by giving a small group of people the power over controlling not only the rights but the the associational rights and the financial rights of those workers that they claim to represent. So, yeah, it's about stripping them of their rights, stripping their freedoms, and then using that money that they can collect from stripping people of rights to elect politicians that will continue the game. And that's where we are, and that's why union officials have to spend billions of dollars every two years on politics because their privilege their privilege and power is a derivative of government action, for sure. Well, when you see people, you know, and there's too many examples to go through, but you see $50 million or $100 million spent on a, a House race or a Senate race. You know, the job pays $200,000, but they drop $50 million to win the seat. It, it seems to – it leads me to believe that maybe the people running for that seat – don't have the people that live in that district, they don't have their best interest in mind, Mark. Maybe I'm just jaded, but it just seems to me if there's $50 million coming in from all over the world for a seat in Congress, that maybe there's other forces at play. Indeed there is, Steve, and we're going to break all kinds of records on Senate races. I think the race in Michigan, the race in, in Ohio are going to be $125, $130 million for a Senate seat. I mean, that's where we are. That's why it's, I mean, government's gotten so big, so powerful in so many areas, not just the area of labor policy and individual workers' rights, but in so many areas that the value of one vote on the Senate floor is, uh, I guess, now adjudicated at $150 million every uh, every election cycle. So, yeah, it is really sad. And one of the biggest players in that, um, according to data that they filed, these are reports the union officials file that are required to be filed by the Department of Labor and the, uh, the Federal Election Commission, show that they, they will per- admit to spending up to $2 billion every two years on politics and lobbying. And uh, that's that's more than a lot of folks. Uh, well, we and don't so know let me the ask you this: of, yeah. where, 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 without all that money, that's, where is the average guy that's in his truck right now driving to work to work for a union that he doesn't want to support? And don't get me wrong, I was uh, involved with. I was a UAW shop steward at one point in my life. I think you knew that. A couple times I was in the UAW. Yeah. Once I was the, the the shop steward or whatever. Um, but it didn't do anything for me. I, I, I was not a fan. 
Look, if you want to be in a union, that's great. I don't have a problem with that. Look, you, but if you don't want to be and you just want to go to work and you don't want your money spent on politics to elect people like Kamala Harris who you don't support, and you say, I don't want my money spent there, and I don't want to be in a union, and I don't want to be forced to pay two hours a month or whatever it is, because it's already too hard to make ends meet with inflation. I don't think people should be forced to do that. I, I'm with you. And Michigan's the first state ever to get rid of right to work where I live. I think it's terrible. I think people, do, I think people in America should have the freedom and the right to choose and should have the right to work. Indeed. That's the position of over 80 percent of all Americans in a poll we're just releasing now for Labor Day, but done by Scott Rasmussen, Rasmussen Media Group. Uh, Seventy-nine percent of union households believe that, Steve. I mean, 82 percent of the American public generally believes it's wrong to force a worker to pay union dues to get or keep a job. But then again, public policy doesn't make policy. Uh, public, or excuse me, public opinion doesn't make policy. A uh, hundred million dollar Senate seats make policy. Yeah. And that policy is, is counter to what the Americans believe. But it keeps and sustains the power that these small group of elite union officials have over rank and file workers across America. Yeah, right now, look, West Virginia, that seat's going to go Republican. That gives Republicans 50 seats there. But 50 uh, is not good enough because we know uh, not if Kamala Harris wins, because then you've got Tim Walls doing the same thing she did, casting, you know, the tie-breaking vote for terrible policies like the Inflation Reduction Act, which did such a wonderful job of racking up our debt. Uh, but Montana looks like it's pretty solidly going red with Tim Sheehy. Uh, looks like he's going to oust uh, incumbent Senator John Tester. There's a very expensive race in a, in a state that has one million people in it. They're going to spend they're going to spend more money uh, than, than the people that live there. I can tell you that by a lot. Uh, and then you've got Ohio, Maryland. Maryland is tied. How important when you look at these races, Mark? And I know you do. How important are these races to defending America, to defending the, the American worker? Well, they're critical, and the Senate's the backstop of all of it because, you know, that's where the passions of America allegedly are supposed to go to cool. It's the, the raw democracy of the House of Representatives is one thing, but the deliberations of the Senate is another. And so the Senate's the one place where the backstop can appear and, and protect basic rights for individuals. If we lose the Senate, and we saw it during the, the Biden administration and with Kamala Harris breaking the tie. So when you think about the right to work state of Arizona, there's a very crucial race there. Ruben Gallegos is a supporter of forced unionism. He wants to repeal Arizona's right to work law. Carrie Lake is a supporter of right to work. She believes that workers should have the choice, like you, Steve. That's an important race. Nevada, same thing. It's a right to work state. Sam Brown, um, we hope that he comes out in favor of right to work, but his opponent, Rosen, is a, is a co-sponsor of the PRO Act, which would repeal Nevada's right to work law and Arizona's right to work law and the other 24 right to work laws in the country. So there's a debate about forced unionism in very key Senate races, and it goes to Virginia and it goes to Wisconsin and it goes to Michigan, where Mike Rogers has said he believes that individual workers should have the right to to decide whether or not they want to financially support. Yeah, and I so agree with him. The right to work issue. Yeah, the right to work issue, while it's not a, a marquee issue that people talk about every day, it's a fundamental issue that's going to play a part in those Senate races. And it sure should. And it's important that folks that believe that workers shouldn't be forced to pay union dues in, in every state that's got a Senate race gets out there and casts a vote for, Absolutely. for a, a senator that believes in individual freedom. Agreed. Mark Mix, president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Mark, always an education, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We'll talk soon. This is The Steve Gruber Show.